So here's our practice question. A 47-year-old Hispanic male presents to the emergency department with chills. He's a former intravenous drug abuser. His home medications include metformin, lithium, mirtazapine, and valproic acid. He was previously on clozapine, but that medication was discontinued five years ago. He is febrile to 39.4 degrees Celsius, hypotensive, and tachycardic. A blood culture shows gram-positive cocci in clusters. He is treated for sepsis and admitted. Laboratory results obtained overnight reveal profound leukopenia. Which of the following best explains this patient's presentation? A. Clozapine. B. Metformin. C. Lithium. D. Valproic acid or E, mirtazapine. So what we have here is we have a patient coming into the emergency room who has some signs of infection and he's ultimately diagnosed with sepsis. It kind of sounds like he's got severe sepsis. You should know your SIRS versus sepsis criteria. Laboratory results reveal that he is profoundly leukopenic, so his white blood cell count is very low. And now the question is, which of the following drugs which he has taken are contributing to this presentation. So basically, this is a question about understanding drugs and adverse drug reactions. Now, I want you to pause the video if you need more time to think about this and if you want to go through the answer choices because I'm going to start to break this down for you. So pause the video if you need more time. But if you're ready, let's get into this. So the first thing that you need to really highlight in your brain in the clinical vignette is what I've shown here in red, right? He's febrile to 39.4, hypotensive, has gram-positive cocci, is treated for sepsis, and is leukopenic. So right off the bat, you know that this is an infection. He's, he meets SIRS criteria. He meets sepsis criteria because he has SIRS plus an identified organism in the blood. He meets septic shock criteria because there's evidence of hypotension and end organ damage. And this is very likely severe sepsis criteria as well. So whatever's happening here, whichever one of these medications is causing this, this is really significant. To make matters worse, you see in red that I've highlighted that he is leukopenic, so his white blood cell count is very, very low. So there's some process going on here that obviously the question is hinting at is caused by one of these drugs that's causing our patient to be profoundly sick. And the question is, do you know enough about these different medications to identify which one is causing this presentation? So the answer here, the correct answer, is E, mirtazapine. What's happening is that the patient is having what's referred to as a granulocytosis. So this is a drug-induced neutropenic or leukopenic reaction. So the white cell count is dropping and because he's unable to fend off infection because his white cell count is so low as a result of mirtazapine, he's getting an, you know, some type of infection. So that's what the correct answer is. And now let's go through A, B, C, and D and point out why they're not the correct answer and also point out what the test writer probably would have had to tell you if they wanted that to be the correct answer instead. So I know a lot of you probably wanted to pick clozapine because clozapine historically is the medication that is classically associated with agranulocytosis. The reason that it's not correct in this question is because the vignette literally tells you that the clozapine was discontinued five years ago. So it's not going to cause agranulocytosis right now for this patient. And because of that, if you're an astute test taker, you should have been thinking, ha, huh, this exam writer wanted to bait me into picking clozapine, but obviously it can't be clozapine. So which one of these other drugs also causes a granulocytosis? So that's the high yield way of thinking, and that's what a question like this is trying to do. It's trying to bait you into the obvious choice that can't be the obvious choice because they tell you quite literally, this medication was discontinued five years ago. So it cannot be clozapine. Of the remaining drugs, metformin, lithium, valproic acid, and mirtazapine, mirtazapine has the highest association with agranulocytosis. Now, some other things that you should keep in mind about clozapine that the test writer could possibly ask you in a different vignette, obviously agranulocytosis, which we just talked about, but seizure, myocarditis, somnolence, and weight gain. All of those are very high-yield adverse drug reactions associated with clozapine. Choice B, metformin. Now, metformin classically on exams, they're going to go after one of two things. It's either going to be GI upset or it's going to be lactic acidosis in somebody with kidney damage. 
The, the lactic acidosis in somebody with kidney damage is the reason that oftentimes when patients are admitted to the hospital, their metformin is not continued. So if you've ever been in a clinical environment, you've probably seen that patients have their metformin held. And the reason is, is because you're not quite sure if they're in the hospital, if they're going to need contrast in any of their CAT scans. And the reason that this is so important is that if patients get contrast, they can get a contrast-induced nephropathy because contrast is actually damaging to the kidneys. So if they're getting contrast and they're on metformin, then they can get lactic acidosis as a result of two insulting agents being introduced to the kidneys. So on exams, metformin is going to cause lactic acidosis. So if you see an elevated lactate level in the absence of any sign of infection or anything else, especially in a type 2 diabetic, think metformin. The other classic side effect of metformin is GI upset. But in the context of this question, obviously metformin is not going to cause a granulocytosis, so B is incorrect. C, lithium. Now, lithium has a lot of side effects, and you definitely need to be familiar with lithium. And I can imagine on a question like this, a lot of you are probably like, hmm, could be clozapine, could be lithium, could be valproic acid, because you're, you know that these are three medications that have a whole ton of side effects. So let's talk about them. Lithium can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. It's a huge, huge high-yield adverse drug reaction. The other things that you want to be on the lookout for are tremor and some basic altered mental status, hypothyroidism, and hyperparathyroidism, okay? Hyperparathyroidism, but hypothyroidism. Those two in combination classically associated with lithium. But in this question, the question is on a granulocytosis. It's on someone with a low white count causing an infection. And lithium just simply does not do that. So the question wasn't going in the direction of kidney injury. It wasn't showing you any abnormal thyroid hormones or parathyroid hormones. But if theoretically you were answering a question and you've got a printout of labs, the test writer would probably show you some derangement in TSH, T4, or T3, or PTH, or creatinine and BUN. So if they want you to go in the direction of lithium, they'll probably give you labs because they're going to show you things like thyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone, and kidney function. The other thing that lithium classically gets associated with on exams is its association in the first trimester of pregnancy causing Epstein's anomaly. So if you get a question and, you know, mom is pregnant and all of a sudden there's some finding on ultrasound or, you know, growing baby has some a uh, cardiorespiratory defect in the first trimester, think lithium, okay? Very, very high yield to know, but again, lithium is not associated with agranulocytosis, and therefore, it is not the correct answer. D is valproic acid, and valproic acid has three very classic high yield side effects that you should know. The first is transaminitis, which is a fancy way of saying an elevation in ALT and AST. And nowhere in this clinical vignette was liver function even mentioned. It also causes thrombocytopenia, so a decreased platelet count. So look for different stigmata of bleeding, which again, is not mentioned in this question. The other really high yield thing associated with valproic acid is its likeliness of causing neural tube defects. So if there is a question where mom is pregnant, she's on valproic acid, and all of a sudden there's you know, some defect that's found on ultrasound or some type of prenatal testing, answer could be valproic acid in that scenario. But again, valproic acid is not commonly associated with agranulocytosis. There are some case reports of it causing it, but for the purposes of USMLE and COMLEX, when you think agranulocytosis, there are, you know, there's a list of drugs that you should be considering, and none of these, except for mirtazapine and clozapine, which is, you know, not the correct answer in this question, are associated with it. So again, the point of this question was to try to bait you into picking clozapine. And test writers love to do this. They're gonna give you some classic high yield adverse drug reaction that can be associated with two different drugs. And they're gonna to try to get you to pick the one that most medical students think of. But you need to read the question carefully because in this case, clozapine clearly cannot cause a granulocytosis. So the high yield bottom line of this practice question in the high yield dirty USMLE video question bank is that if a patient has a granulocytosis, look for evidence of opportunistic infection or severe sepsis that comes out of nowhere. The drugs that are known to cause, cause a granulocytosis include clozapine and mirtazapine, as we talked about. But the other one that you want to keep in mind is carbamazepine, so the anti-epileptic drug, sometimes also used as a mood-stabilizing drug, carbamazepine. 
Some other medications that can cause agranulocytosis include methimazole in thyroid disease, colchicine, the NSAID, PTU, dapsone, and teclopidine. So, you know, the ones in red are the high yield ones that I would say to memorize if you're struggling for some brain space, but be able to recognize that the other drugs there also can cause it. So in this case, I made you choose between clozapine and mirtazapine. I could, you know, a test writer could not give you clozapine, mirtazapine, and carbamazepine because they would all cause it and they'd have to effectively tell you in the vignette that the patient is only taking one of them. But those are the three that you should definitely know and then be able to recognize methimazole, colchicine, PTU, dapsone, and ticlopidine as well. The way that you're going to approach this on exams to really reinforce this high yield way of thinking is that you're going to differentiate which drug is causing the adverse drug reaction based on the unique symptom. So if you're sitting there, let's say theoretically you had absolutely no idea what any of A, B, C, D, or E did. Let's pretend you knew nothing about agranulocytosis and you're like, damn, I really don't know which drug here is causing uh, agranulocytosis or whatever it is that the question's asking. The other way to approach these questions is to sit there and be like, okay, if they wanted me to pick lithium, what would the question be describing? Or, okay, if they wanted me to pick um, valproic acid, what might the question be describing? And then in your head, go through the things that you know. So for lithium, be like, okay, it causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it causes tremor, it causes problems with thyroid function, but I don't really see any of that in this question, so it's probably not lithium. So that's how you think high yield, high yieldly, if that's a word, and critically, when you have to guess. You look at the answer choices and be like, if they wanted me to pick this answer, what would they be telling me in the question? And if you don't see that, that's a great way to eliminate possible answers when you have no idea what the actual correct answer is. So that is how you think in a high yield critical manner. Last point here for our high yield bottom line of example number two is remember that if examiners want to go after certain ADRs, they're going to pick the high yield ones. So they're not going to pick like a downstream nonspecific uh, symptom. So when you're studying pharmacology, don't memorize that a drug causes nausea and vomiting because every drug causes nausea and vomiting. Don't memorize that a drug causes headache, because every drug causes headache. What you wanna memorize for adverse drug reactions are the unique high yield side effects. Things like gingival hyperplasia, okay? Things that are unique to one or just a couple drugs, not nonspecific symptoms. So guys and gals, this is example number two in my high yield video question bank. I'm going to be adding a lot of questions to this series. My goal is to literally get into the thousands. It's going to take me a long time to do, but I'm going to try to do it. If you want to support me on this endeavor, please become a patron and support my channel. Love you all. Keep up the great work.